This week on NJ Business Beat, prices still rising faster than expected. We dig into the latest inflation numbers and when we could see some relief. Plus, a healthcare worker shortage reaching crisis levels in New Jersey. The need is real. Healthcare is so vitally important to our economy. What lawmakers are doing to incentivize people to get into the medical field. And we put New Jersey's housing market in focus, from sales cooling down to rising prices and the fight to create more affordable housing. That's ahead on NJ Business Beat. is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us this week. After writing the rent check, paying for groceries, and shelling out money to commute for work, there's not much left in the bank for most of us. This is the sting of inflation, and prices for all sorts of products and services are still rising sharply. Inflation is so strong that this week the Social Security Administration decided to give recipients an 8.7 percent cost of living adjustment, the biggest in more than 40 years. And concerns about inflation in the economy are front and center in midterm election campaigns. Inflation is measured by the CPI index, which is up 8.2 percent over the past year. Food prices are up more than 11 percent, and the price of gas is up 18 percent since last year, although we did see lower prices at the pump last month. Meantime, core inflation, which measures prices of everything else, is also marching higher by 6.6 percent. It is not a pretty picture. U.S. policymakers like to see an inflation rate of just 2 percent. So when are things going to become more affordable? Experts can't say for sure when inflation will be stopped. Even with these rising costs, New Jersey's economy has been holding up. But that could be about to change, according to Rutgers University professor James Hughes, dean emeritus of the Blaustein School. Professor, first of all, it's nice to see you on NJ Business Beat and talk about an issue that we really can't seem to escape, and that is inflation. The latest numbers out this week show more pain for consumers. Uh, first of all, why are we seeing inflation continuing to surge at this very strong pace? Well, basically, even though energy costs are coming down, uh, past increases have started to filter through the economy as a whole. So even though uh, we may see a slightly cheaper gas at the gas station and the like, uh, we have many other, many other uh, forces pushing up prices throughout the economy, sort of an after effect of what we had uh, earlier uh, in the year. So, and we still have uh, uh, issues uh, with uh, a very, very strong job market. Uh, even though the Federal Reserve has been increasing interest rates in order to combat inflation, uh, we keep adding jobs. And we, as we keep adding jobs, we keep adding to demand. And it's those demand forces uh, that are pushing up inflation uh, across the board. How detrimental is inflation to New Jersey residents and the economy here? We know to start with, New Jersey can be an expensive place to live. The nation has recovered 102% of its employment losses. New Jersey has actually uh, uh, accounted for 103% or recovered 103%. So we're slightly ahead of the nation. Yes, we are more expensive, uh, but we're still applying the same percentage increases uh, to our basic costs in the state. Uh, but what is happening is every time we have high inflation, every time we have a recession, uh, it's uh, the lower income sector of New Jerseyans that get hit the worst. Do you think New Jersey is in a recession right now or will be soon? Not right now. I mean, our job growth has been uh, unusually strong. It's been actually been stronger than the nation as a whole. So uh, that's a real positive. And so uh, we are sort of in uncharted territory. There are a lot of negative indicators out there in terms of gross domestic product decline, but we still have a very robust, strong labor market, which is really carrying the economy right now. 
The last time we saw a severe recession, 2008-2009 period, New Jersey was hit harder because it was very much concentrated in the financial industry to start. Is our economy in better shape in New Jersey to weather a recession should it come? As we move into uh, 2023, we'll probably have a recession. Hopefully it's just a recession yet and not a full-blown recession, but it is coming. Well, there's no way to avoid that given the pace of increases uh, by the Federal Reserve in terms of uh, interest rates and the like. Uh, but 07, the great 2007 to 2009 recession, uh, really was the, was the uh, bursting of the credit bubble that existed uh, uh, between 2000 and 2006. So it was uniquely concentrated in the financial sector. Uh, this time, it's going to be a broad-based recession, not tied to any ex unique excess in the economy linked to New York or New Jersey. So some positives for sure, even as we navigate through whatever is ahead. Thank you so much for your time and for joining me. Uh, my pleasure. COVID-19 case numbers continue to decline in New Jersey, and a new poll finds most residents feel the pandemic's impact on their daily lives is over. The latest survey by Monmouth University finds 71 percent of the respondents oppose bringing back COVID-related restrictions like social distancing or face masks. Just 25 percent support reinstating them, and support for guidelines has been eroding over the last few months. 63 percent of those surveyed oppose showing proof of vaccination at work or other gatherings. The poll also asked whether residents believe the pandemic is over. 21% of the respondents believe COVID is gone for good, while 50% say the pandemic will never end. Monmouth University's poll of just over 800 residents was taken in late September. Healthcare workers are in high demand in New Jersey with critical openings going unfilled. It's a situation that worsened during the pandemic, especially in the field of nursing. New Jersey is projected to face one of the most acute nursing shortages in the entire country by 2030, according to estimates from the federal government. Democratic state lawmakers this past week introduced a package of bills they believe will attract workers into the healthcare industry, including working with the state labor department to transition unemployed workers into health care. Assemblyman Lou Greenwald is one of the sponsors. We are losing people to this remarkable profession. For New Jersey, a state of 9.3 million people, this is our largest industry. 500,000 of our residents are in this workforce. And while we have a lot to be proud of in New Jersey, and one of those things being we are basically at full employment, where for everyone who wants a job, there are two job opportunities for them, it hurts an industry like this. They equate to a $44 billion annual investment in New Jersey. That's how important this industry is to us. The state will step in and oversee operations at Trenton Waterworks to ensure safe drinking water supplies for Mercer County communities. The announcement this week comes shortly after the mayors of four towns near Trenton called for a state takeover of the utility, with Hamilton Mayor Jeff Martin citing years of gross incompetence at the facility. According to the Murphy administration, the Trenton Water Works system has intermittently struggled to monitor water quality and invest in required maintenance and new infrastructure, among other things. The move comes two years after the state sued the city of Trenton for failing to pay for mandated system upgrades. Housing affordability has long been an issue for many people in New Jersey, and a new report says immigrants are hardest hit. The report by the advocacy group Make the Road NJ points out that New Jersey is the seventh most expensive state in the nation for renters. The group polled residents in three New Jersey cities with the highest percentage of renters and found that some tenants are living in dangerous and unhealthy conditions, and they're having trouble affording their units. In Elizabeth, nearly 60 percent struggle to pay their rent. Nearly 44 percent of the renters in Passaic face difficulties in paying rent, and that's also the case for more than a third of the renters in Perth Amboy. Things are going from bad to worse, according to Gerardo Benavides, who works with Make the Road. Renters are in a crisis. That was true before the pandemic, and it's only been exacerbated since. Rents are increasing. So in each one of these cities, a majority of renters reported that their landlords are increasing their rent at least every year. 
and renters don't have the means to pay the rent, um, either because of job loss, uh, stagnation in wages, and they're struggling to pay for rent and to pay for basic needs to put food on the table. This week on NJ Business Beat, we're putting the cost of housing and the changing dynamics in the housing market in focus. Like everything else, housing costs have been climbing in New Jersey, and mortgages are more expensive, too. Mortgage rates jumped to their highest levels in more than two decades, according to Freddie Mac. As of Thursday, the average 30-year fixed mortgage was 6.92% in terms of the rate, with many lenders offering rates well above 7%. A year ago, the average mortgage rate was just over 3%. If you want to buy a single-family home in New Jersey, it's going to cost you a half a million dollars, according to the latest stats from NJ Realtors. That's the median sales price, which represents an 8.7 percent increase so far this year compared to the same period last year. One reason for those higher prices, low inventory. The number of new listings is down more than 20 percent compared to last year, and the number of sales closings is down 17 percent. I talked about what's ahead for the market with Jessica Louts, a vice president at the National Association of Realtors. Jessica, first of all, it's great to have you on NJ Business Beat, and I'm so intrigued to talk to you about the housing market. It has been quite a couple of years. Let me talk to you first about some rather big news this week. Mortgage rates continue to rise, and they've now hit levels not seen since 2006. How is this going to impact the housing market? the recent and very steep rise in interest rates, it really has exacerbated potential home buyers buying power. And they're having a very difficult time entering the market, especially for first time home buyers who don't have the housing equity that homeowners have to rely on. We've had this very unusual situation in the housing market where we're also still seeing um, until recently home prices rising and they've risen a lot up to this point. Will we now see a turnaround? Are the big gains in home prices over? We're still seeing year-over-year -year gains in home prices, but what's important to note is that they are moderating. In all honesty, that's a good thing for potential home buyers who are trying to enter the market because we had seen gains that were double digits in most parts of the country, including New Jersey. And that's up until the most recent months of data. We're starting to see them now into a healthier pace, into a moderated pace because of this rise in rates. But it doesn't mean that demand is waning and we certainly don't have enough supply for buyers out there today. And that's why prices keep climbing. What is different about what's going on in housing now than other times where we saw a disruption in the economy? I'm thinking back, of course, to 2008, 2009, where we actually had a collapse in the housing market. Is this going to be different if the economy is in a recession now or heading into one? Yeah, we're in a very, very different market today than where we were in 2008. And there's three main reasons why. One is we have incredibly tight lending standards. It's very difficult to obtain a mortgage today. You have to have a high credit score. You have to have money in reserves. You have to have a high income to be able to obtain a mortgage. The second reason why is we have substantial underbuilding. We really have been underbuilding homes in the U.S. for more than 15 years, and we don't have the housing supply like we did during that time period. And the third reason why is pure demographics. We have a wave of young adults who are entering into household formation. They want to find a home, and there is not the available inventory. And unfortunately, seniors, they're not necessarily budging from their homes. You mentioned it's a tough time for potential buyers. Is it still a seller's market, or are there some difficulties there now? We're still seeing that nearly a third of home sellers are receiving more than asking price. Homes are moving in 16 days on market, so still a pretty strong market, and they're typically receiving 2.5 offers. So I would say it's still a seller's market, but they're starting to see some equilibrium. Jessica, really great to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Fewer people are applying for mortgages these days. In fact, applications are down nearly 40 percent compared to a year ago, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association. I spoke with Steve Grossman, chief strategist and partner at NJ Lenders, about the trends he's seeing now in the mortgage market as rates rise. Steve, first of all, great to talk to you on NJ Business Beat. Pleasure meeting you, Rhonda. So we continue to see these mortgage rates move higher. What is this doing to the mortgage market overall 
and lending in New Jersey in particular. When you look at New Jersey, you can't paint the entire state with one brush because New Jersey's um, made up of many little micro markets. But in general, um, the volume has uh, reduced tremendously, but it's not necessarily driven by the rates. One of the reasons we're, we're, we're doing less business is there's still an inventory shortage on housing in the state of New Jersey. So if there is a well-priced home um, there, you know, in a nice town, there's still multiple bids. So the, the, the lack of transactions for the overall industry here is really driven by the housing market first, not necessarily the mortgage rates. There are a segment of the population who from affordability perspective um, has been eliminated or maybe pushed out of the housing uh, market for the time being, but there's still an ample number of buyers that are prepared and willing to, to buy even with these rates. And given where the rates are, which of course, compared to the, where they were a year or two ago, it is quite a bit of a sticker shock for people. Are you seeing the underwriting right now predominantly with fixed rate 30-year conventional mortgages, or are there other mortgage products that people are gravitating to at this point? The lower the loan amount, people are still taking more fixed rate product. But when you start getting into the higher loan amounts or what's called the jumbo loan, people are um, considering taking adjustable rate mortgages. Uh, we're never uh, great forecasters or predictors, but when you look at rates at these it's not, they're not historical highs, but the highest we've seen in, in many years, there's a good probability that in the next nine to 36 months, people have an opportunity to refinance their loan. So um, the jumbo investor, it, it merits taking an adjustable, taking a little bit more, um, the adjustable, excuse me, jumbo borrower will take on the risk. And a lot of these um, loans are very conservative. The rates can be locked in for five years, seven years, 10 years, or even 15 years. So a lot of the population believes that within the next nine to 36 months, they'll have an opportunity to refinance um, their mortgage and of course get a lower rate. The common term that's being used out there is uh, you marry your home and you date your mortgage. So a lot of people recognize that um, it's a good time to buy. Uh, you still get the tax benefits. You still are paying down debt. Well, thanks so much for talking to me to give us the insight of what's going on in the market. Really appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome, Rhonda. And thanks for having me on your show. The path to home ownership is an uphill battle for many. And for black and brown residents, it is a much tougher fight. For them, owning a piece of the American dream can be out of reach. But they have an advocate in Brian Woody White. He is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Homebridge Financial Services based in Island. He's determined to shed some light on the home buying process for black and brown residents who he says are handicapped by their own lack of knowledge, along with institutional racism against the minority community. Woody, it's so nice to have you on NJ Business Beat. Thanks for your time. Thank you. You are really on a mission to change home ownership, not just in New Jersey, but beyond. Why today do we still see such an issue with disparity in home ownership in this country? Well, you know, overall, right now, black and brown home ownership is at its lowest level since 1968, which was basically the creation of the Fair Housing Act. And to be honest with you, a lot of it really has to do with, first, we're talking about poor communication in these communities about really the real steps to getting a home. On top of that, there's an education problem around things like personal finance and budgeting and how to prepare for a home. But really, one of the other big problems is the issue of individual and institutional racism. And that's really a big problem right now that's all over the place. You know, for example, you take in New Jersey and in the, in the Northeast, one company was fined $24 million for redlining and another was fined $12 million. And if you take a look at what HUD is doing right now, HUD has had to release a program called PAVE just to deal with the constant lowering of valuations for black homes in neighborhoods that are similar to white neighborhoods. And when it's that bad, you know, you know, it, it sounds simple on the surface, but when you're black and you're constantly running into these problems, it gets tiring and you just don't want it. You just say, you know what, I'll stay in the apartment that I'm in. How specifically are you working to change the equation? I know you and I talked about some of the efforts that you really want to push on the education side, getting the word out any way you can. Right. For example, affordable lending is a term you're going to hear a lot. 
And affordable lending really isn't a program. It's really a marketing name for income-based programs that are underneath programs like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and so forth and so on. But what you have to understand is inside of a mortgage company, you really have wholesale, retail, and servicing. So buried under retail are just income-based programs. So one of the things that I had to do first is internally within HomeBridge, create a channel that is for affordable lending to kind of raise it up as an income opportunity for loan officers as well and deal with that. So that's the first thing that I did. But the second thing that I'm working on right now is a new program that will probably release 2023, you know, just because of the economy and everything the way it is right now, but it's called Finally Home. And it's a new way to approach education in black and brown communities because we obviously, what, what's been done up until this point is not working. Woody, I really applaud all the efforts that you're doing on the education front. You are also coming up against the economy and mortgage rates have really climbed. Do you worry that black and brown potential homeowners will be set back even further just given what's happening with rates? We have to do something on two fronts. One is, what are we gonna do about the skyrocketing price of homes in the inventory, right? Even if the inventory comes back and the homes cost too much, if the house costs too much, then it's gonna be outpriced above what you can get with an affordable loan. So we have to fix that problem right now. And I don't know what we can do about it just yet, but you have large equity companies buying entire communities of homes and they're forcing people to rent those homes. And if that continues, that means that any one of us trying to move to a community that you want to live in, you think the house is available and you go there and you can only rent it because one of these massive uh, equity firms have bought the communities and there's less inventory forcing us to rent. Woody, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Very much appreciate it. This week, Jersey City announced its intention to move forward on the first building of Bayfront, a waterfront development project. The city's planning board signed off on plans for a 210-unit residential building, with 35% of those units set aside for affordable housing. New Jersey communities have been mandated to provide affordable housing ever since the Mount Laurel decision decades ago, and yet there are still not enough places for lower income residents to live. I talked about that with Adam Gordon, executive director of the Fair Share Housing Center. Adam, as you know very well, we have a huge affordable housing problem in New Jersey. Many people say it's a crisis. Is it getting worse? Uh, I would absolutely agree that it, it is a crisis, Rhonda, and I think it is getting worse. All the data that we're seeing, record rent increases. There's even data showing that uh, Jersey City and, and that area has the highest rents anywhere in the country. And so I, I think we're seeing an unprecedented crisis. And the good news it's, is because it's a lot of people want to live in New Jersey right now. The bad news is we're just not building enough housing to keep up with that. The organization you work for recently put out a report basically looking at what's worked and what hasn't worked when it comes to affordable housing in New Jersey. What needs to happen now to spur some of that development to at least start chipping away at the problem? Rhonda, we're dealing with a lot of outdated regulations and rules, especially at the municipal level. Uh, there's lots of owners of older shopping centers, office parks, that would be more than happy to use them to build starter homes, affordable housing, and it's just not allowed. Are you still seeing significant resistance in some communities to a mandate to require affordable housing in new construction, for instance? We are definitely seeing resistance in some communities. There's certainly communities that are doing a good job uh, and that have, have, have moved the ball, uh, both urban and suburban communities. We, we've seen a lot of improvements in, in some places. So let's circle back on regulations. Are you having conversations with state lawmakers about potential changes? Is there any hope that there will be some headway on this in the legislature this session? One great bill that we've been supporting, uh, Majority Leader Lou Greenwald, uh, Senator Troy Singleton have been pushing this bill that would require that municipalities uh, approve conversions of existing office parks and shopping centers uh, to apartment buildings and townhouses with a requirement for 20 percent affordable housing uh, and, and i'm bypass a lot of these years of, of, of red tape and 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 blocking things we're seeing 
from localities. Do you think more has to be done to keep out private investors from buying real estate? Um, for instance, if we start to see more development of shopping centers, and this actually comes to be, what if you know a big corporation just comes in, buys it, redevelops it? Do, don't we then have the same rent increase problem? We do need restrictions. We, we can't just have it be you know whoever can buy properties, uh, price it at, at, at whatever it is, because you know we do have the supply and demand imbalance, and we need to have some protections. And we also really need to look at that. You know, we're, we're losing some existing affordable homes, especially in, in areas that are gentrifying. And we need to figure out how we protect those homes uh, and allow those to remain affordable and, and for long time residents to stay in their communities. The required set aside from Mount Laurel, should that be reconsidered? Should it be higher now? I think there's places in which it can be higher. And I think we've seen that. We, we, we have seen uh, places in which you're seeing 25% or 30% set asides, but it really depends on, on the details. I think that it's, it's easier to do that in some parts of the state than others. And uh, I, I don't think in terms of that, a one size fits all solution is gonna work. Well, it's been very good getting caught up with you to see the latest on this affordable housing issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Rhonda. And uh, well, hopefully we can work towards something that's gonna help ease this housing crisis. And that does it for us this week. Remember to subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. Coming up next week, we explore how to strike the right work-life balance, even if it means finding a new job. I'm Rhonda Schapler. You enjoy the rest of your weekend.